Welcome to Railway Legends, Myths, and Stories. I'm Kevin Stanley. In this episode, I will talk about a legendary locomotive. Let's go to the United States of the early 19th century and to the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company. In 1820, William Wirtz, a Philadelphia merchant, had explored northeastern Pennsylvania for sources of coal. He found extensive anthracite deposits, hard coal. Coal was badly needed as much of the local nearby timber had long since been exhausted. Wirtz, with the backing of his brothers, garnered wide financial support for a canal to move the coal. While the charter for the D&H was for water communication between the Delaware River and the Hudson River, their main aim had been the movement of coal to places like New York City. While building a canal was their main effort, they also had the grant to build a gravity railroad to feed the canal. They decided that the new idea of steam locomotives could be used to move coal along the rail sections. At the time, there were no manufacturers in the New World that could build locomotives, so the D&H sent their agent Horatio Allen to England to buy the equipment they needed. Allen favored the Stevenson C Company locomotives for their advanced technology and superior design, but, well, Foster, Rastic and Company were so much less expensive. So the order was split with one locomotive ordered from Robert Stevenson and Company and three from Foster Rastrick and Company. So now we look to the first locomotive to be steamed in the New World. On the 15th of January, 1829, a spanking new imported locomotive arrived in New York City. It was built by the Stevenson Company and was named America. It had also been known as the Pride of Newcastle. Now, we are going into some conjecture here, but this is based on some pretty good detective work, and, well, it, it sounds pretty probable. Early in the 21st century, some researchers were looking through the Smithsonian Institution. Believe it or not, there are many items that have never been properly cataloged or indexed in their collections. There is a good reason that the Smithsonian Institution has been called America's Attic. Getting back to the researchers. Among the many artifacts they found was a small, coffin-shaped carved wooden box. This box may, may have been some sort of memento of a special occasion. On top of the box was the carving of a very old train. It had been inscribed, John B. Jervis, 1829, D&H Canal Company. Hidden under the lid were the words, blew up on 26 July, 1829. This may or may not be a reference to the Locomotive America, also known as the Pride of Newcastle. The Delaware and Hudson was not in the best of financial health. The loss of their first locomotive might have been, shall we say, downplayed to keep the investors from running for the hills. Remember, this is the early part of the 19th century and they might have headed for the actual hills. Well, the D&H had ordered multiple locomotives, and the next was from Foster Rastrick and Company. The D&H's second locomotive is most well known as the Stourbridge Lion. This name is usually attributed to the lion's face painted on the front, as well as Stourbridge in England, which was the home of the company that built it. In mid-May 1829, the Stourbridge Lion arrived in the New World. The locomotive was taken to the West Point Foundry in New York, where it was then assembled. Note that this is just 11 years since Richard Trevithick's Pinadaran locomotive made its first run, whereas the Trevithick locomotive operated at a pressure of around 210 kilopascals, the Stourbridge Lion had a working pressure of 345 kilopascals. So the working pressure had increased from around two atmospheres in 1804 to almost three and a half atmospheres in 1829. Some may look at the Stevenson locomotive and then disparagingly at the somewhat older technology of the Starbridge Lion. The Lion used an old-fashioned and complex linkage. The up and down motion of the piston linkage looks something like the hind legs of a grasshopper. On the 28th of May, 1829, at the West Point Foundry, 
the Stourbridge Lion was tested. The engine had been placed on blocks. The engine was then steamed up and all operations could be tested without having the locomotive go anywhere. Now let's look at the next part of the story in a new light. It has been said many times that the Stourbridge Lion was too heavy for the tracks of the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company. DNH Chief Engineer John B. Jervis had specified that the locomotive should weigh around four tons, whereas the Stourbridge Lion weighed far more. Many references give the Lion's weight as seven and one half tons. Other sources have the weight as 6.4 tons. Well, there is no doubt that the locomotive was much heavier than it should have been, but was this all there was to its troubles? Later in 1851, Horatio Allen stated that the tracks of the D&H had been built in early summer. Even though the wooden rails were of large dimensions, after long exposure to the summer sun, the timbers had cracked and warped. And I should make this clear, yes, the rails were made of wood. While they did have a thin strip of metal on the running surface, overall the track was made of wood. So on the 8th of August, 1829, Allen took the controls of the Stourbridge Lion and made a run up the line at a fair speed for a distance of three to five kilometers. A second trial took place on 13 September, 1829, but the locomotive was found to be too unstable for the line. Not only was the weight well over the specification, but this was not the only thing that made the Lion unacceptable for the railway. A fixed frame and a distinct lack of flexibility were the main reasons it had trouble keeping to the line. The Lion was set aside and did little until about 1845 when it was then dismantled. Bits and pieces went here and there. What is left consists mostly of the remains of the boiler. These are in the possession of the Smithsonian Institute. There is every indication that the Lion's problems were all due to the poor early track of the Delaware and Hudson. Let's give Foster Rastrick and Company its due, though. They built a similar locomotive called Agenoria, which was used on the Shut End Railway in England. Agenoria was in regular service until around 1865 and is now preserved at the National Railway Museum in York. In the early years of the 20th century, the Delaware and Hudson Railway prepared reconstruction drawings of the Stourbridge Lion. These drawings from 1932 are about all we have of the Lion, and they were then used to build a replica. The reproduction was made for the use in pageants and special events. Between the Agenoria and the replica of the Lion, we have a pretty fair idea of how this locomotive looked and worked. Perhaps, given a better track and a bit more luck, the old Lion might have been able to give a better showing. And as always, we'll see you on the train. However much the rails have to bear. <laughs>